Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to know your word. Lord, we study the scripture because this is where we find truth. Lord, this is where we hear the words of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And so it's with great gravity that we come to the text this morning to consider it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to focus on your word. Lord, that you would help us to move all those other things out of our mind. Lord, the cares of the week. Lord, even the cares of this morning. So that we can rightly divide your word. So that your spirit can infiltrate our heart, Lord, and help us to examine our own heart, our own motives, our own behavior. Lord, we want to glorify you. We want to walk close to you. We love you. We pray that you minister to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we talked about the economy of the kingdom, okay? Now, economy can sound like a boring term sometimes, but not really when you're in it. When you're in economy, it's not boring anymore. Sometimes the word economy can be boring if you don't make money, but when you start making it, it becomes sort of exciting. When economy of the kingdom, if you're outside the kingdom or you, maybe you consider yourself a Christian, but you're not very engaged it can seem boring, but when you're engaged in this life, the economy of the kingdom is very important. Peter asks, what, after the rich young ruler comes, we talked about, and he is, goes away sorrowful because Jesus says, well, you lack one thing to inherit eternal life, and that is that you need to sell everything you own and give it to the poor. He walked away sorrowful. He had many nice things. There was no room for the eternal life in him. It was too full of other stuff. But anyone who would give up everything to follow Jesus Christ and his economy, you receive eternal life. You receive the, the greatest reward and the same reward as anyone else, no matter what stage of life you're in, when you choose to follow Jesus Christ. You may say, well, I don't know if I've wasted my life. I don't have much more to give Jesus. It doesn't matter. It's not about duration. It's about the commitment. It's about your heart. When you choose to follow Jesus Christ, no matter what stage of life you're in, you have the reward of eternal life. Same as the Apostle Paul, same as someone who's followed Christ for 100 years. You have the same reward of eternal life coming to you for that. The cost is great, but it's worth it. And if you see that it's worth it, then you're going to willingly abandon all that you have. Consider it loss for the sake of following Christ, just as the Apostle Paul did. Now, as we continue on, one of the things the disciples I, I talked about last week sort of locked in their head was when Jesus said, when Peter said, well, then what should we have? Jesus says, you're going to sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. That's a pretty big deal. I think that kind of hung with them a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That suffering thing was easy to forget. But the reward of maybe being close to Jesus, that was a big deal. And they'd already been promised that by Jesus. That wasn't enough for James and John, the sons of thunder, the zealous sons of thunder, these wild men. They wanted some assurance of a little bit more. So, before we get into that, Jesus, for the third time, in verse 17, for the third time, he proclaims his own death and resurrection. And there's a little more detail given in this account this third time he tells his disciples this, than in the other accounts. In the other accounts, we see Jesus says he will suffer at the hands of the, the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they will kill him, but on the third day he will rise. But we get more detail in this one. Verse 17, And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged 
and crucified, and he will be raised the third day. So what details are given here that are not given elsewhere is that Jesus will be delivered or betrayed, okay, into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, the, 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 the chief priests may have had the authority to condemn someone to death, but they didn't have the authority really to put anybody to death because they were under the government system of the Roman Empire. Okay? Only Rome had the ability to execute capital punishment. That was their thing. They were the reigning authority over capital punishment. Now, if you were insignificant, like Stephen we see in the book of Acts to the Roman Empire, they could be overcome with rage, take you out back and stone you, okay? And maybe nobody would know. But if they stoned Jesus, people would know about it. There would be problems. Jesus had thousands of people following him. They held him at least to be a prophet. There would be a threat to the, the lives of these leaders if there was an insurrection. They were really afraid of an insurrection, especially in Jerusalem. Remember, there, this is the end of Jesus' ministry. He's coming down. He says, we're going into Jerusalem. When he goes into Jerusalem, it's, a, it's just a hotbed of, of just every violence, insurrection. It's all on the brink because here you have all of Israel piling into Jerusalem for Passover. And so the Romans are on high alert. Like they want to make sure no riots break out, nothing happens. Pilate is nervous about this. If, if if there's an insurrection in your city, you're held accountable to that. So the Romans are on guard for insurrection. Jesus knows that. And an example would be made by the Roman government of anybody who's insurrectionist. They had a special execution in mind for people who are insurrectionists. The Rome had a lot of ways that they could execute you. Okay, they could chop off your head. They could burn you alive. They could stone you to death. They could strangle you, right? Or they could crucify you. And crucifixion was exceptionally cruel. It was, it was to last several days, at least three days, as long as you could, you could survive. And every time that someone would lift up on that cross to get a gasp of air, they would cry out. So where did Rome put these crucified people? They put them right at the gate. So if there was ever an insurrection when you came into a Roman city, you saw these poor, wretched men screaming for their lives without mercy, the buzzards pecking at their eyes, the dogs nibbling at their toes. And you knew, I'm not causing trouble in this city like these guys. It had a purpose behind it. And Jesus went intentionally to be crucified like one of those poor, wretched men. He went intentionally. It was no accident. In fact, crucifixion was the only form of execution that Jesus could fulfill the prophetic um, requirements that were laid out. We just read Psalm 22. What does it say there? It says, dogs encompass me, right? Gentiles, they divide my garments. We know from the, the gospel, what we'll read later, that they divide his garments up, right? The, the Roman soldiers are like, hey, this is these are good clothes. Let's, let's cast lots. Let's, uh, let's say who gets them, right? It was, an, it was necessity that, that the sacrificial lamb of God, from Leviticus, Leviticus 19, it says that, that if you're going to eat an animal, you have to pour its blood upon the earth before you eat it. You can't eat an animal with blood inside of it because the life is in the blood. So when Jesus says he gives his life as a ransom for many, life and blood were synonymous. So the Lamb of God had to shed his blood. The Lamb also couldn't have any of its bones broken. As we know from Exodus, the Passover Lamb, when it was given, it couldn't break any of its bones. If Jesus was to be stoned or his head would be chopped off, obviously there'd be some bones broken. If he was burned or strangled, there would be no blood shed. So this is the only form of execution which meets the requirements of Scripture. I would say that it was in God's providence 
that it existed just for this very purpose, that Jesus would suffer much for us. And when we pause and we think about the reality, this is the third time he said it, but this time he even says that the Gentiles, he would be turned over to the Gentiles and he would be mocked, be mocked. If you turn over to Isaiah 53, it says in verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Jesus would be mocked. He would be chastised. It says that he was mocked. He was chastised. But he rebuked the shame, right? He rejected the shame. In other words, the shame that would come from chastisement, Jesus rejected that. He received it as if it belonged to him. He owned it. So that what? So that we may have peace. The prophecy about these Roman soldiers that would, or these, these, these Jewish leaders that would put a punch of something over his face and say, if you're a prophet, prophesy who's about to hit you. And they'd punch him in the face. They'd spit on him. They'd mock him. Even that was prophesied. And Jesus went there on purpose. He went there on purpose. But he promises that he would be raised on the third day. Now, it seems like every time Jesus mentions that he's going to be killed and raised the third day, nobody has any follow-up questions for that. Nobody wants to even consider it. They just sort of let it blow right over their heads. They just sort of like, oh, I don't even think about that. Maybe this isn't another analogy. He said it three times. But they just sort of let it blow over. And then this happens. We see this contrast. Uh, of where the disciples are at and where Jesus is at. Where are they at? Well, let's see. Verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said, say that these two sons of mine are to sit at your right hand and on your left in your kingdom. Now, hey, we can, we can at least acknowledge that she definitely believed that Jesus was to be the king of kings. And she wanted some glory for her sons. And we know that this was a, an agreement between all of them because Jesus addresses James and John in response to her request. Okay? But this is sort of underhanded. This is, this is a little bit of manipulation on their part. Now, their mother was named Salome. Okay? And she, believe it or not, was actually the, the, the sister of Jesus' mother, Mary. So this is his aunt. And James and John are cousins of Jesus. So you see there's a little bit of familial pressure here, right? Oh, come on now. I mean, they were in the inside circle. Peter, James, and John, they were the ones who were invited to see the little girl risen from the dead. They went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. But, you know, Peter's been rebuked several times. So these guys are probably thinking, come on, if it's anybody, if it's anybody who's going to be in right and left hand, it's going to be us. Let's just, let's just point blank ask. They've already asked Jesus earlier, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? This is something the disciples are really concerned about. Their glory. Their glory. And Jesus responds, you do not know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. You see, they're all about the glory of being at the right and left hand of the king, but they had no idea what that would cost. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink? Or I am to drink? Remember in the garden, Jesus will say, Lord, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. If there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. And the agony and the humanity of Jesus Christ he is suffering greatly because he's about to receive the wrath of God. That's what the, the foaming cup of the Lord is. The bitter wrath of God upon the cross. He would take our sins. 
the wrath of God that we rightly deserve, Jesus would consume for us himself. So when he asked, are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink? He's asking a rhetorical question, but they answer it anyway. Right? We are able. <laughs> they have no idea what they're saying. We are able. He says, you will drink my cup. You will drink my cup. And they would. They would suffer for Christ. All of the disciples, all 12, would suffer for Christ. They would all die in martyrdom, except for, I shouldn't say all 12, 11. We believe that John, the apostle, dies of old age. But he lives a life of suffering. He lives a life of exile. James was the first to be killed for Christ. He was killed by the sword, by Herod. So he's the first to be killed, and John is, it's interesting, isn't it? These two men, the first of them, is the first to enter glory by martyrdom of the apostles, and the second one, John, is the last to enter glory of all the apostles. Jesus says, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared for by my Father. So if the road to being near Christ in his kingdom, because we know when Christ returns, he's establishing a kingdom. And when he establishes a kingdom, he's going to have magistrates over that kingdom. And the magistrates with the most responsibility are going to be the ones who have suffered and humility, the greatest. Though we all receive the reward of eternal life, the responsibility we have in the kingdom has much to do with that ranking in the kingdom. Every kingdom has ranking. But the, those who would be near Christ in that ranking would be those who have suffered for Christ. They've suffered. Now, when the ten heard it, verse 24, they were indignant at the two brothers. They were angry. They were grumbling. Man, they were mad. And it wasn't because they were like, come on, guys, get with the program. Right? It wasn't like that. They were just upset because these guys were trying to rule over them. Right? You guys going to try and cut in line. Right? That's how kids feel when they're in line at lunch. And then you ever had the kids who were like, hey, you cut me, I'll cut you. Right? And they do a little switcheroo. But the kid behind them is like, come on. Right? He's angry. Because you just cut in line. That's what these guys were trying to do. They're just trying to cut in line through manipulation. MacArthur calls this a political power play. That's what this was. An inside scoop. It's not about what you know, it's who you know, right? That's the way the world works. But Jesus called to them, and because they're so indignant, they're upset, they aren't really getting it. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, okay, this is how the world works, lord it over them. That means they domineer it over them. They just kind of throw their weight around. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Great ones, I got word is megas, means like loud, charismatic, right? We have a lot of people even leading in many churches that are in leadership because of their, their eloquence, their ability to manipulate people to maybe domineer over people, threaten people. They, they say, I, I really think God is calling you to this over here. I think God's calling you to clean the church every week, right? And you're like, well, why? Because I said so. I'm the pastor. I'm the closest to God, obviously. And if you don't listen to me, well, it's a hot place in hell for people that reject and turn away from their pastor, right? They domineer or they manipulate. I know that you want to serve the Lord, don't you? Don't you want to serve the Lord and reap benefits in heaven? Yes, I do. Well, I tell you, we've got a need for people to clean. Mm. Be a servant of the Lord. There was a guy in our church back, back home when I was in high school. I hated when he said this because he'd always say, why don't you have a servant's heart and go pick up those chairs over there, right? Or go have a servant's heart and do this. He was telling me to do something and spinning it like, you know, go have a servant's heart. Right, because I said so, right? And of course, being the mature high schooler, I would say, 
why don't you have a servant's heart and pick him up yourself, right? It's probably not the wisest thing to say. I was in sin, I was an older man. But it's something that we need to remember. This is the way it works. But Jesus says in verse 26, it shall not be so among you. This is not how the church of God works. This is not how leadership works. We see leadership, the leadership that, that Christ outlines and, of course, exemplified, and we'll take a look at that closer in Philippians chapter 2, is not one that domineers in 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter's talking to the shepherds, the leaders, okay, the servants. He says, don't domineer over people. Don't bully people to get people to do what you want them to do. But lead by example. It's not going to be that way with you. I've had, um, I was the assistant pastor in the church that I was in Laramie, and sometimes I'd have guys who were coming to seminary, and they'd ask me, you know, how do I go about, you know, getting to the pastorate, you know? How do I go about doing that? And, uh, and my answer was simple. It says here, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And the word for servant here is the same word that we get for deacon. Now, deacon, the word and how it's applied is not really given until the book of Acts. So we're not going, we're going to take this in context of what we're given here and how Christ is giving it and the time that he's giving it. But this basically is someone who's a servant, a hired hand, somebody who does the things that you don't really want to do. Takes out the trash, cleans up the yard, right? Like a maid or, a, or somebody who comes in and kind of cleans up, like a little hired hand. You get the, the junk around the house cleaned up, right? This is the kind of person you want to be if you want to be great, if you want to be great in the kingdom. So what I tell these guys, these young guys who come in, they say, how do I become a pastor? How do I get to where I do that? Uh, I say, well, if you're already doing it, the church will recognize it and probably ask you to be a part of their leadership. I don't like when, uh, when churches are in need of a pastor. And, and it's sad. It's a situation they're in. I don't know if there's any way out of it. It's a, it's a hole that they dig themselves into when they find that they don't have a pastor anymore and they've got to find one. But because they haven't been doing the discipleship in their own church and raising up young men to be men of God, they've got to look outside. What do they do? They hire, they have somebody come in, they do a couple of sermons, they're all wowed by that, and they hire somebody based on that. That's how they do it. But that's not how it's supposed to be done. They must be your servant. This word also means a minister, a minister, a servant. Now, when we hear the word minister, oftentimes we're thinking of somebody who's up on a pedestal. They're all cleaned up. They tell people what to do. But if you're really actually a minister of Christ, you're great in the kingdom. That means you're in the service of other people. You're in their service. And then he goes a little further and says, but whoever would be first among you. So not just great, but chief, first, numero uno the right and the left hand of Jesus. If you're going to be first, you must, uh, whoever's going to be first among you must be your slave. Whoa. That's a big deal. Now you might think that Jesus is just sort of blasting the whole idea of leadership out of the water. If you're only thinking in the mind of the Gentiles, in the mind of the way the world works, then yeah, that's, that's exactly what's happening. If you're the type of person that thinks that they're going to get ahead by manipulation and by domineering, and you want to be a, uh, somebody who's a real mover and shaker in the church. And you're going to do that by your influence and your, your eloquence. Then yeah, that kind of blows out of the water. But I, I think it gives hope to the humble here. Those who, who just want to humbly serve the Lord. They see that it's their personal um, obligation, their, their personal conviction from Christ. That the well-being of others in the body is more important than the well-being of themselves. These are the type of people that are going to be great in the kingdom of God. He turns it upside down. And lastly, Jesus gives himself. And then you can see there's almost a, con there's a connection here to what he says to them in the very beginning about how he's going to be crucified. He says in verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's the answer. If they were confused about why Jesus kept saying he was going to die, why did he keep saying this? And why is he saying now that he's going to be crucified? Here's the answer. That not only did Jesus give his life, but to come on his earthly ministry to serve others. And who was he serving? The poor, the wretched, the weak, the downcast. Later, it's not going to say it in Matthew, but in the other gospel accounts, Zacchaeus, shrimpy little tax collector, he's going to minister and dine with him. That's not the only reason Jesus came. There are some religions that teach that Jesus, when he lived out his earthly life, he was just living out an example for us. And if we can just catch that example, we can be as he is. That's not the only thing Jesus did. He wasn't just coming to serve and to be an example. He also came to give his life as a ransom. Eternal life. What service Christ offers. He's giving his life as payment. Peter would say that we have not been purchased, right, by perishable things like gold, silver, precious stone, but by the precious blood of Christ. We have been purchased out of the slave market of sin. We've been purchased from the damnation of death and judgment. How? Because Jesus lived his life out perfectly, and then he offers his life as the atoning sacrifice for our sin. What a model. You see, when you're looking at a model for leadership, when we look at all the leaders in our life, and we say, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that lady there. I want to be like that person. We tend to emulate them. When these guys come and ask Jesus if, if, if they would make them right in the left hand of, of him, he says, if, if you really want that, you understand you have to be as I am. You have to be as Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, uh, picking up verse 6, well, verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why is Jesus exalted as Lord? Because he has condescended to the lowest. He is exalted to the highest. If you want to be highest in the kingdom, you've got to be lowest. You have to humble yourself. You have to be willing to suffer. For Christ, if that is what you want. Really shakes off all those people that really want it the easy way, doesn't it? Who want it the world's way? By who you know, right? That may be how the world works, but that's not how the church works. It's not how the kingdom works. And the kingdom, by the way, is eternal. So that should be something that we're most concerned with, more than anything else. It says here, and this is really great. It doesn't just end the chapter there and move on. Not that these were broken up in the chapters when they were originally written, but Matthew adds one more thing. This story. This is neat. This is the where not only is Jesus teaching, but we see him exemplifying everything he just said. We're going to see a contrast between the way people were thinking and the ministry of Jesus Christ here. As they went out, verse 29, out of Jericho, a great f crowd followed him, and behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and 
when they had heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, the behold wasn't necessarily that there were two beggars on the side of the road. That was all over the place. Blindness was common back then. They, you know, it wasn't like you could go to the eye doctor and have some surgery, or if you got something in your eye, sometimes it would fester and you'd lose that eye. Many children were born blind because of the bacteria from their mother was passed on to them. If, if a woman had gonorrhea, that meant that the child was going to be blind, born blind. And so this was common. It wasn't necessarily a shocking thing. Behold, pay attention. If there's two blind men on the side of the road. That was normal. What was shocking is what they said as Jesus passed by. First, they call him Kairos, Master, Lord. They give him proper, the proper uh, title. Have mercy on us, son of David. They called Jesus by his, his messianic title, the son of David. The son of David, the one prophesied, right? In 1 Samuel, or 2 Samuel chapter 7. Say 2 Samuel? Yes, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Where God promises David that there will be an eternal kingdom from his body. And this was the son of David, the son of David, the one who would have an eternal kingdom. These guys spouted out. Where'd they get their theology, right? Amazing. They knew this was their only chance. The crowd rebuked them, telling them, be silent, quiet, right? Quiet. Leave the master alone. Can't you see he's on a mission? Jesus was like, see, we're about to go to Jerusalem. This is the moment. And they're all, their heads are swimming with that. He's teaching them about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. He's going by Jericho. Now, there were several Jerichos then. Uh, there was the Jericho ruins, but then further south of Jericho was another Jericho, which was kind of like the new Jericho. And they called it that. Okay, they left the ruins alone. They built a new city there. I've seen the ruins of Jericho. It's fantastic. It's amazing. There's still jars of grain that are burned to a crisp because they obeyed the Lord and they didn't take spoil for themselves. They burned the city. It's still there. You can literally look at them right in the ground. This would have been Jericho further. So there's a couple explanations because in other gospel accounts, it says that when they drew near to Jericho, these blind men were crying out to them. So it kind of answers, there's a couple of ways you could explain this, either because it says as they left Jericho in this passage, but in the other, it says when they drew near to Jericho. Well, it could be that they were going by the old Jericho and then coming into the new Jericho. Other commentators say it could be that Jesus was leaving Jericho, but then on hearing these blind men as they came around the city, he came back in and ministered to them. But they're crying out. And they're crying out, not demanding that God correct this blight in their life. But they're crying out for mercy. Have mercy. The true, penitent, repentant heart does not say, God owes me something. I deserve this. That's the pride for a worldly system. And unfortunately, it's leaked into the doctrine of many churches, which says that you deserve the love of Christ. We don't. We cry out for mercy because our sin is our own sin. We have sinned because we are sinners. That's in our nature. And these poor blind men had the nature of blind men, and they cried out for the mercy of God. Although the crowd tells them to be silent, it says in 31, but they cried out all the more. They screamed even louder. Shrieking screams of these blind men, desperate for the mercy of God. They knew this might be their only opportunity to receive the mercy of God. After he was gone, they may never have this opportunity again. So they cry out all the more. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want for me to do for you? You see that? Everybody else was like, just ignore these idiots. Ignore these poor fools. It's probably their sin that got them into this situation to begin with. Probably deserve what you got. 
But as they cry out to Jesus for mercy and identifying him for who he is, he responds to that. And it says that he has compassion. They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes and their eyes. And immediately they received their sight and followed him. They followed him. They hadn't followed him for three years like the other apostles. Right? So like we talked about before, their duration in following Jesus wasn't very long. But they followed him. They followed him in the last hour of his ministry. And you know what? They're going to res- receive the same reward as anyone in the duration of their life. Jesus condescends to them. He loves them. Sometimes I think we think we've talked about, about that before, about how Jesus didn't break the bruised reed or quench the smoking flax. What annoys everybody else about you, Jesus isn't annoyed by. What annoys you about yourself, Jesus is not annoyed by that. If you call upon Jesus for who he is, cry out for his mercy, the amazing thing is that when God recognizes that heart, he turns and he heals. He heals out of a heart of compassion. He was moved to do it. It is the heart of God to redeem people. And so he does. They receive their sight and they follow him. Even now in his ministry, he continues to reach out to the lowest of the low. What do we get from all this? Well, maybe among many other things. I want you to think about, because this is something I had to think about. How do you see yourself in the body of Christ? When you come to church, do you expect to receive or do you expect to serve? Do you want to be great in the kingdom or do you want to be served? To be a servant or to be served? Which do you want? Which should you want is obvious. I'm not asking which one should you want. We all know that you should want to serve. But when we examine our own life, we examine our own behavior, you have to consider this. Do you look forward to the opportunity to serve? Now some of some of you, this is the first time you've ever been to this church, right? Like, I don't know, I just got here, right? (laughs) I totally understand that. But as you continue on with us, if you continue on with us, if you can hang. There's going to be more and more opportunity for ministry. And trust me, you'll get no pressure from the leadership of this church. We're not going to be like, now look, you've been here for a while, right? It's not domineering. We don't pressure people that way. We allow that to come from the Holy Spirit. We allow the Spirit of God to infiltrate people's minds. Because something that's interesting about someone who's being changed by the Spirit of God is they start to become more like the Lord. We begin to be fashioned into his more likeness. And so we begin to start to get more joy from service. It's not like we're uh, obligated to do it. We enjoy it. For, I, I don't know, I think it must have been Providence, but God really gave me this week in the barbershop where I work. I had a guy come in and he, um, just a nice kid. He was, he was interning in a, at a law firm and he was there on break. Uh, and kind of working this internship. He's about to go back to school. And he was dressed nice, and his shoes were a little scuffed. So I said, hey, you want me to shine your shoes? And he said, well, that's okay. I said, it's free. I, I just do it. He's like, oh, I, I guess I could use some shine. And so I knelt down. I take out my little stool. I set it down by their feet, and I begin to shine this guy's shoes. And he begins to smell the polish. He says, oh, man, I, that reminds me of my dad. I, that's really nice. And I, I just work hard on his shoes, and I get them real glossy. And he looks down and he says, wow, these look like they're brand new. And he walked out of the shop happy that he had his shine, shoes shined in addition to his haircut, something he didn't know he was going to receive. And all of a sudden I got this joy from doing that. And that's when I realized that what God begins to do in us, because that's not in me, that's not in Sam, I'm a selfish pig. I am. 
God is changing me. He continues to change me. And as he continues to change me, I've learned something about people who have the heart of service. Is they get joy from seeing the well-being of others. They actually get joy from that. I got joy from that, and that was a gift from God. That was a gracious gift from God that I got joy from that service. And it taught me something about our master. That Jesus, when at the Last Supper, when he kneels down and washes the disciples' feet, he wasn't like, oh, fine, I've got to be another example of my humility, and gets down and scrubs their feet. See? See how humble I am? Right? No, he, he enjoyed it. He said, you see this? This is what I'm about. They're still bickering about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom by that point. They don't get it. You know what? When Jesus dies on the cross, he's raised from the dead, he does something that he promised in John 15. He sends the Spirit of God. And the Spirit instructs them. And the sanctification process begins. And we start seeing a change in the disciples. We see it in the book of Acts. We see it in the epistles. We see it in men like Saul, who becomes Paul, who go from being terrorists to people who are most concerned above all else of the welfare of the church, of the welfare of their brothers. And Jesus said, you will know them by their love for one another. Jesus said, people are going to be able to identify that you're my disciple by your love for one another. That's who's greatest in the kingdom. That's what we promote in our leadership. That's what we want for our people. Is for you to enjoy service. Because the more that you do, the more you know you're being changed and conformed to Jesus Christ, who is our example. The road to greatness in the kingdom comes with much suffering, with an attitude of service. That shakes off the world. They don't want that. They don't want anything to do with it. Why would anybody want to become a Christian if your life gets worse when you become one? Well, that's the mystery, isn't it? Yet it continues to grow. God continues to change people. The way God is is so contrastly different, so opposite of the world. The only way that God shows that is when he saves someone, he starts to change him into somebody more like himself, and it blows the world's mind. If you want to blow someone's mind, love them, serve them, and ask the Lord to send the Spirit to continue to conform you into the image of his Son, to live for him, because no one suffered more than Jesus, and no one is exalted higher than Jesus. We exalt him by being obedient to him. If you want to be obedient to him, you want to suffer like him. That's a joyful opportunity for someone who knows the weight of glory that's coming for it. But for those who don't, it seems like a giant waste. So where are we? Where are you? How does that sit? If it doesn't sit well, I invite you to spend some time with your Jesus and ask him to conform you to that nature. We welcome anyone who wants to serve here, to love here. Let's love one another. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, your word, your word is good and your word is pure and enlightens the eyes. It's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. It keeps us from stumbling into danger. And when you came and lived your life out on earth, God, very God, illuminating the world with his ways, you said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. When we look at your word, we look at it with joyful anticipation. Lord, because the more we walk with you, the more mysterious joy we receive from just being near the one who invented all joy. We love you. And Lord, when we think about the, the very fact that it was obedience and humility that brought you to the cross, Lord, you knew you must go. You went because you were being obedient to go. You went on purpose. And that you went to be a ransom for me. That humbles me. I pray that it humbles all of us. 
Lord, that we're inspired by your spirit to be more and more like you. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name.